of some wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God to I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou This morning, turn your Bibles to John chapter 19. We'll read one short passage of Scripture this morning. And I, I know you've been up and down, but I want to ask you one more time. If you would, stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. John 19, verse 30, says this. One verse says, When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, He said, It is, what? Finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Father, thank you, God, for finishing. Lord, I've seen a lot of folks start. Seen a lot of folks up and down. But I sure am glad that we got a God that finished. And God, I pray, God, Lord, that we would follow your example. And God, that we would 
we would thank you so much for what you've done for us. But God, that we'd finish our course. We'd run our race. And God, we just thank you for what you did for us on Calvary's cross. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. He said, it is what? It is what? Finished. What a wonderful words to say. It's finished. Well, then I thought about it. I was like, I was thinking of sayings from the cross that, that I was supposed to preach on, and I was going another direction. I even told my wife this week, I said, uh, I said, I know the direction I'm going. And God just went, oh, is that the way you're going, or you want to go the direction I'm going? And, and so I said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll go your direction this time. And I find out that when I go his direction, it's always a better direction to go. But I was thinking of this subject and what was finished. He just said, it is finished. It's a big word. Somebody asked some times when we was growing up, the joke was, supercalifragilistic espialidocious and you'd ask somebody can you spell it and they'd try and then you'd say no it can you can you spell it <laughs> and it's a big word well some of these kids got that they'll leave with that they'll add, they'll go to the school and say a word they'll be like all right can this word and say can you spell it it what was finished and I was thinking of this subject, and, and we got to go this week, and, and uh, if, if you didn't get to go to any other show, one of the things we said that we wanted to do before we ever left, we wanted to go see Moses. We just, we wanted to see Moses at Sight and Sound Theater. Sight and Sound Theater is, is one of them overpriced places you go that, uh, that you really enjoy it, and, uh, and I'm looking around at that thing, and the banker in me, as I'm sitting there, I'm looking around, I'm saying, there's about 3,000 people here. They've paid about, uh, about 50 bucks a head to get in this place. And I'm, I'm looking around, and I'm like, oh, my stars. No wonder they bought this building. They built it. But there was the story of Moses, and it, it went all the way from his birth all the way through. But there was the part of the story that come out in my mind and just made me think about this when I was thinking on this subject. The time that they let them all go and, and, and it was getting ready to leave Egypt. And in Egypt, we know the plagues. We know about Pharaoh. and We know all the things that happened and, and all the things that happened to Pharaoh. But one of the last things that happened, the, the very last thing was the night before Pharaoh let them go, they told them to... Take a lamb and kill that lamb. I wonder, at our house, we, we left for a week and we left. We had little chicks this little big and we left. When they came back, they was this big. Y'all understand that? It's kind of like when you see your, your grandkids at Christmas. You know, they're this big and they come back next year and they're that big. But... I wonder how many of those, never really thought about it, how many of those little lambs have been raised as pets? How many of those little lambs, they look for the perfect little lamb? And you know, when you got children, if they see the fluffiest, the prettiest, the, the thing, I wonder how many of them little lambs had just been cuddled and cared for and as their very own, I mean as a, as a little child, there is nothing more cute and cuddly than a baby lamb. If you've ever got to, to hold a baby lamb, they are just, I mean, they are just cute and cuddly. But that night when God said, take that lamb, that special lamb, and everybody kill it. I wonder how many children was crying because they took that little lamb. I wonder how many was saying, I don't want my lamb. They said, God said it had to be happened. But what did my lamb do? What, what did he do? He didn't do anything. They took the lamb and they killed it. They spilled the blood out. 
That child, I can see the child just crying. Saying, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. They took that blood. They went up over the door. Took that blood and wiped it down on the doorpost. The child weeping inside saying, that was my, that's my lamb. My lamb. He didn't do anything wrong. Why? My lamb. Year after the year, this has went on, the Passover, once a year, they'd take that precious little lamb. They'd take it for each household and do it once a year. Once a year. This had been going on for many, 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 many years afterwards. When the death passed by, they went over that house where the blood was on the door and they passed over. They didn't have death in that house. You say, why? I'll tell you why. Because a long time later, the disciples loved Jesus as much as those children love that dear lamb. And Jesus was there. As he's taken the beatings, he's taken the marks, he's being bled out. The disciples are saying, but he didn't do anything wrong. Why would they take my lamb? Why would they do it? He did nothing wrong. <laughs> they can say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> when he said, It is finished. What he was saying is, No more little lambs have to die. No more little ones have to give up. To show that sin has paid for. No more blood of bulls and goats. No more. What I wonder is the Jews for thousands of years that denied the Messiah has come. My question is, then why aren't they still sacrificing their lambs? If they don't believe the Messiah has come. If they don't believe that God has Take it away. Why did they stop? Because he told them that was a memorial every year to remind them the blood has been applied to pass over. God had passed over their sin one more time. I want you to know the lamb on the cross said, It is finished. Then what else did it say when he said it? Is finished. It's got a lot to do. When it was finished, it's it. <laughs> what else? I'll tell you what else tore down on that wall, on that cross, according to the Bible. The wall between God and man. Right now in politics, there's a whole lot about building a wall. But I want you to know there's a whole lot in the Bible about tearing down this wall. There's been a wall. That sin built between God and man, that man cannot do anything to climb over it. He can't go under it. He can't go around it. There is nothing he can do to get past this wall. We're sinners. We're sinners. I heard a comedian one time talking about heaven. And he actually said, if heaven is such a great place, he said, how come they built a wall around the city coming down? He said, are they scared people's going to break in? I tell you what, if we could break in, we would have. It ain't to keep people in, it ain't keep people out. You say, why? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 through 16, let me show you what the Bible says. It said, for He is our peace who hath made in both one. He hath broken down that middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, to making himself twain one new man, so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You say, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. When he said, it is finished, the wall came down. The wall came down. Years ago, President Ronald Reagan, when Germany was divided between East Germany and West Germany, and they said that we'll never 
be able to say that it's a free Germany as long as there was remnants of that wall still there. The president told him, he said, General Secretary Gorbachev, he said, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberal liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That happened. He told that speech in June the 12th, 1987. But in November 1989, the wall came down. Dividing the two. But I want you to know it didn't take two years from the time Jesus said, break it down. This wall that separated God and man, He says, it is finished. Do you know what that means to you? The Bible says that we can come boldly under the throne of grace because God allowed Jesus to break down that wall between God and man. Just break it down. The Bible says that the veil in the temple that kept people out, that kept the glory of God in, that when Jesus died on the cross, His flesh was rent, and that curtain was rent from the top to the bottom. It went down and it made way to the holiest of all because on that cross, when that death happened, when He said, It is finished! He's saying, Hey, no more! No more do you have to go to anybody. You can go to Jesus Himself. People sometimes will tell me, say, Preacher, yeah, I need to talk to you. And I mean, what is it? And they say, I need somebody to tell, man, I, I just having some problems. I say, stop. If you want me to pray for you about something, I'll pray for you. But if you're confessing, you don't have to confess to me. <laughs> don't confess to me. You say, why? Because I can't do anything with your sins. <laughs> I can't do a thing with your sins. You say, what? You're my pastor. That's exactly right. I'm the lead sheep leading the other sheep. But I'm just a sheep. We have one shepherd. There is one mediator, the Bible says, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. When he said, it is finished, he did away with the hierarchy of the priesthood that man goes between, that stops man from coming. When God on the cross died, it broke that. So now we can come boldly. You can come boldly before the throne of grace. You say, wow! You mean because I'm a Christian, I can go before God? No, you can go before God because on the cross He said, It is finished. <laughs> That's the only reason you get to go. Because He knew we couldn't scale this wall. <laughs> he knew we couldn't blow it up. He knew we couldn't bribe the guards. <laughs> he knew we couldn't do anything but just depend on God to tear it down. Wow, what a great God we serve. It is finished. And then, not only did He finish, sacrifices was it. <laughs> Tearing down the wall between God and man was there. He also finished something else. He finished His course, His path. Did you know that God has a plan for you? <laughs> that God has a path for you. I actually had this illustration a while back and I, I thought about it tonight, today and I said how small things can happen. Sometimes we think we are not significant in God's plan. Do you ever feel insignificant? Sometimes if you look up at the clouds and you, you, and you look up and see how vast it all is and you, you look at the stars at night and you realize how they go. I mean just... They're, they're without number and they just go out there and you, you realize just how big it is and you realize just, just how small that we are. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like, I'm just a speck of dirt. By the way, that's a good bluegrass song. <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm, I am just a little bitty speck. But let me tell you something about small things. The gospel was introduced to Japan 
because a portion of Scripture that floated ashore and picked up by one man. He sent for a Bible and was instructed by the missionaries because one man picked up some washed ashore Scriptures. The queen of Korea lost her child by death. A slave girl in the palace told her of heaven where the child had gone and the Savior that could take her there. And the gospel was introduced to Korea by one little captive maid. <laughs> the battle of Bennington was gained because a little lame boy in Vermont set a shoe on Colonel Warren's tender-footed horse, <laughs> enabling the colonel to lead his regiment. The victory of Bennington decided the Battle of Saratoga, which decided the Revolutionary War, and it started with a little lame boy that shooed a horse. Don't you think you're, you're not important in God's plan? The hunger of the son of Columbus led him to stop at a monastery in Andalusia, not Alabama, and ask for bread. The prior, it said, of the monastery who had been a confessor of the Queen Isabella, heard the story of the adventurous navigator and brought an interview with the Queen. Brought about an interview with the Queen, which resulted in the sailing of Columbus, the discovery of America, and it hinged on the hungry, the hunger of one small boy. It all started. Robert Bruce took refuge in a cave from a pursuer seeking his life a spider wove a web across the mouth of a cave. When the pursuer came and saw the web, it took for granted that no one had entered and the destiny of millions of people hang, hinged upon a little spider's web. <laughs> Don't you think that you're not important to God? Don't you think that your plan is not important? You get up and you go to work every day and you do your job and you think, what am I to God's plan? What am I? I what am I doing? I, I, I only go so many miles from my house. I, I'm just so, I mean, I'm not big in God's plan. Don't you take for granted what you are. You have a plan. God has a purpose in your life. The devil would love to make you feel like you didn't matter. You matter to a holy God. You matter enough that on that cross when he said, it is finished. It was His plan for you. The song said when He was on the cross, I was on His mind. You was important to a holy God. In John chapter 17 verse 4, how do you know His path was finished? He said, I glorified thee on earth and I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do in John 17 4. He said, I'm finished. I got my job done. You know, it feels good when you get something done. At m me, everybody's different. I have a hard time getting started. I, I went upstairs and uh, started a bathroom remodeling project. And I went up there and I looked at it and I had floor rottening and it dripped in the kitchen. That part's still not fixed. But I went upstairs and I looked at it and I said, you know what? We need to take that tub out, put a shower in, replace this floor, do this to this bathroom. She said, that's great. That's wonderful. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to run out. I'm going to go ahead and buy some stuff. So I went out, bought a new toilet, bought some flooring, Two years later, I went upstairs. <laughs> I walked in that bathroom. I busted it out. Six months later, I put down the other floor. <laughs> I got it done, and within three months, the kids had the ceiling look like it did before I ever started. But anyway, I have a problem. I look at something and I'll be like, man, I don't even want to get started because I know that once I get started, man, I try to stay with it. I do. I try. Man, I'll look at it and I'll be like, oh, I don't want to get started. I don't want to get started. Summertime's coming. Any idea? You see them weeds growing? I went out the other day and said, I need to cut the grass. Got the kids to pick up the sticks. 
got them out of the yard, ready to go, looked at it, the tire wouldn't air up on the lawnmower. I said, that's good, let's go in the house. <laughs> It'll do. Went in the house. I tried five minutes to get it to air up. Three out of four was working. I should have just leaned back and kept going, but I... But I know that once I start, I'm going to, I know once I start, you can ask her, once I ever get it cranked up and running, I'm not coming in. I'm going to finish. I may come in, take a, a water break, but I'll get out, grab the weed eater, go head to toe. I'll work from daylight till past dark. I'm not stopping till I get done. Once I, but I have problems getting started. Man. That magnet on my backside seems to get, get pulled more to that recliner. Y'all understand what I'm talking about. But Jesus started it. He started the work. Three years later, when He was heading up Calvary's Hill, you say, did He want to quit along the way? Sure He did. How do you know? In the garden, He said, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. You know, He was saying, hey, if there's any other way, stop this. I know what's coming. If there's any other way. But I thank God that His Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, had it in Him not only to start something, He had it in Him to finish what He started. Because if He hadn't have finished, our salvation would not be complete. We would not be able to go to heaven. He didn't just start. I love on Calvary's cross at the end, He said, it is what? Finished. His work was finished. It was finished. It's hard sometimes to finish what you start. Amen? One fellow said he went to the doctor and the doctor told him to finish what he started. So he finished a whole dozen of donuts. He said, I finished it. I'm working on finishing that pie. I'm working on it. I'm finishing it. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. But before he said, I've kept the faith, he said, I finished my course. Do you know what? God don't expect you to be nobody else in this room. God does not expect Richard to be Alan. He does, he does not. He does not. He does not expect us to be anybody else. He doesn't. But God has your course, yours, that nobody can run but you. And sometimes you feel like your course is not important. But it's important to God. And if you're a father, you're a mother, you're a worker taking care of your family, you're a grandparent that feels like you just give, like you didn't, you didn't do what you're supposed to do, and you feel like they didn't heed my counsel anyway. I tried to raise them in church, and I'm living for God. What's the use? Don't you give up your course. You started your course. You finished your course. At the end of your journey, God will look down and say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You're not responsible for their course, but you are responsible to God for your course. And when you stand at the end of your life, you can say, Lord, I've run my race. I have finished my course. I'm not Billy Graham. <laughs> not Fanny Crosby. But God, I can run my race. I can make an impact in my world. I can teach my kids to pray. I might not can change all the public schools in America, but God, I can change in my home. God, I might not can change every workplace, but God, I can make it better in my workplace. God, I might not 
can change every church in America, but God, our church can stand for something right. God, I might not can do everything to everything. I might not be able to fix the Southern Baptist Convention, but God, Hopewell Baptist Church will stand for something. We can't do anything about it, but we can finish our course that God has given us to do. All because Jesus said, it is finished. Let's stand. Father, in Jesus' name, take the message today and bless it.